everybody. Um, I'm Vicky from Plus Accounting um, and just to introduce the topic and set the scene for today, um, we're going to be talking about the challenges that are facing gaming studios, in particular about growth, <coughs> acquisition and retention. Um, we'll be recording the session, as I said, so any questions that you've got throughout, please save them to the end and put them in the chat box or Q&A box. Um, there are many challenges that are facing the gaming industry, but we believe from a financial standpoint that there's never been a better time to, to be in the sector. And we've therefore pulled together a panel of experts from the world of accounting, law and managing wealth to help break down these challenges into practical steps for you and to ensure that your business is ready for growth. So just a quick hello from our speakers. So if I start with Mark. Uh, good morning, uh, Mark Cardi, Benchmark uh, Financial Planning, uh, part of Schroeder's family of companies of the T100 uh, company. Uh, I'm a chartered financial planner, and what that means is I build, implement, and run long term financial plans uh, for my clients. I specialize in working with business owners uh, and have a number of uh, clients in the gaming sector. Uh, and when I talk about working with business owners, that means them personally, their business, and their families. Nick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Thomas. I'm a Chartered Accountant and Director at Plus Accounting. Uh, I specialise in the game sector and I act for around 160 video game studios, uh, ranging from, from micro studios all the way through to established um, companies that are you know, 50 plus employees uh, requiring a range of accounting and tax services. And Dom. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Don Travers, solicitor at Nice Solicitors, uh, from solicitors with offices all over the country, um, based in Brighton. I'm, I'm a corporate law specialist, which is basically advising companies. Um, and in connection with the, the games sector, I've uh, done games flotations on AIM and uh, at the starting point, I've uh, been involved in the inception of businesses that are looking to grow. Okay, thank you very much. So if we get going with the discussion by starting with those that are just starting out in their studio or gaming um, journey. So um, a question that we kind of get asked quite a lot by those that are starting out is around something of, I've developed a game with some friends, I'm looking to release it in the next few months, but I haven't set anything up yet, so what shall I do? Um, I, I think... For me, uh, get a, a new business fledgling, it's looking to do something. Um, it's about prioritising the probably limited budget that people have available. Um, certainly on the my, my legal list, the first thing that people should seriously consider and do is set up a, a company. If you don't set up a company, basically what you're doing is trading, trading as an individual which is fine, but after a certain point, that comes with risks. And to set up a company, um, you're, you're setting up a separate legal entity it's regarded as a person um, under law. So that company can enter into contracts, it, it can employ people, it can raise its own finance, which Luke will talk about in a bit more detail later. Um, it owns its own assets, including IP. It's very company's very easy to set up. So if you um you went online at nine o'clock in the morning, you put in the name of the company, who the director is going to be, who the shareholder is going to be. Probably later later that afternoon, you'd have a new company available. It costs you about fourteen quid. So there's there's a certain amount of mystique about how you set them up, but it's actually very simple. Um, in terms of the way companies are structured, you have directors, which are the people that make the day to day decisions, and you have shareholders. With the people that own the shares. You, you, usually as startup businesses, the, the, the directors and shareholders are the same. Um, a great advantage of setting up a company, you have loads of flexibility around the ownership. Um, so you, a company can issue shares and basically you issue shares that have a value of say one pound uh, with a view that in the future those shares are going to go up in value. And any one pound shares issued in the future might be worth, say, five pounds. So that's that's where the ownership lies. Um, shares can be subdivided. You can issue them in different classes of share, different share classes. Um, you can allocate dividends between different share classes, have different voting rights and so on. Um, 
So it's def definitely worth talking to advisors before setting up a company, because um, sometimes people get it wrong and issue too many shares without realising that you have to pay for them at some stage. Um, and also shares get issued to people that might not stay with the business and, you, and it's difficult to get them back. So that, that's certainly uh, top of my list. Um, and also, last but not least, there's a lot of flexibility around um, how you treat tax um, within a company. That's right, Dom. Um, yeah, so um, one of the key decisions um, that a lot of people are looking at when they're looking at um, possibly setting up a limited company um, is comparing tax implications of being a self-employed or sole trader versus the tax implications of being a limited company. Um, when you're self-employed, um, you pay tax uh, on your profits as they arise. So if you make £20,000 of profit in tax year, you'll pay tax on £20,000. If you, pay, if you make £100,000 profit, you pay tax on £100,000. So when you are self-employed, um, it's, it's quite difficult to predict how much of your profits you should be putting aside um, you know, in, in view of how much tax you're going to have to pay further down the line. Um, but when you're a limited company, um, you have a fixed rate of corporation tax on your profits. Um, up to 50,000, it would be 19%. Um, and above that, coming into effect next year, um, there's 25% uh, at, um, at the effective rate between 50 and 250,000 is actually 26.5%. So worst case scenario, you pay a fixed amount of 26.5%. From a personal tax point of view, um, once the company's paid its corporation tax, you have complete control over how much uh, tax you pay. By being the director and the shareholder, you can choose how much uh, you pay yourself as a salary how much you pay yourself in dividends out of the profits that the company has made. So you can have exact um, sort of determination on, on how much personal tax you're going to incur. Um, and what this can, can benefit you um, with is, um, uh, in terms of personal taxes, how much of the money each month you put aside. So budgeting is a lot easier because you can take out £2,000 a month and know that if you put £200 a month uh, aside for tax, that you won't have to worry about tax, um, you know, as long as you've saved for that. But also, if you've got other sort of uh, personal uh, tax implications of having higher income, um, you can you can sort of plan around these. So, you, for instance, you might have student loan repayments due um, on your income. So, if you decide to keep your income below the, the student loan threshold, you can defer paying any student loan back um, for a long time. If you've got children and you claim child benefits, um, you can keep your income at fifty thousand, um, which allows you to. Um, ensure that you can keep all of your child benefit and none of it's clawed back. So lots of um, reasons to sort of um, have the limited company set up for purely tax reasons. Um, but you do have to bear in mind the additional costs of, of having a limited company versus being self-employed, consultancy costs, um, insurance and the like. So it can, be, it can be more expensive. So you have to weigh in not only the potential tax savings, but the actual um, additional costs um, overall to work out which is the right route for you. Also considering the point that Dom's already raised about the reducing your personal risk as well. Mark, is there anything around the insurance kind? Yes, I, I think for me, the, the clients that I've had at this early stage, quite often they have families and quite often they left a larger company. Um, and they're trying to manage a range of you know, risks and mitigate them. At that stage. But one thing that's clear is the success of the business and the plan. Um, requires the, the, um, the founders to turn up fit and well and actually run the business. Um, so getting a framework set up correctly at the start, which is you know, the framework of discipline and the right behaviours give you, you know, a lot of structure to build on as, as the studio grows and becomes more profitable. So I'll start with a few numbers. I'm sorry, they're a bit morbid. Um, but that's what happens when we talk about insurance. So the statistics I'll give you are for a 50-year-old smoker going to age 70. I accept that that's a bit skewed to prove a point, but it is skewed to prove a point, and that's why I've done it. Um, so the chance of uh, death, let's just start with a really cheery subject, uh, for someone that age is 14%. Uh, the chance of a critical illness is 36%, and the chance of not turning up at work for at least two weeks, because uh, sorry, two months, because you're unwell is 40%. Now, any of those, the probability of any of those happening to one person is almost two thirds. 
So whilst we've skewed it with the age and the health of the person, what that shows us is if you're younger, the risks should be lower. If you're healthier, the risks should be lower, but they're not zero. So setting up that and looking after yourself and your family, because ultimately that's why the business has started so you provide for you and your family. Because if you're unable to work, statutory sick pay mm -hmm. is 99 pounds and 35 pence per week currently. Mm -hmm. And that's paid for 28 weeks. Uh, I don't know if I would struggle to live you know, on that. So your company as a business expense can pay for a higher level of cover for you and for longer. So you can look after yourself yeah, and your family. Uh, but though for me, the most important bit of that type of insurance isn't necessarily the money that get paid out, although that's important, is that they will also help you get back to health and get back to work because the insurance companies want to manage their claim, which is you. If you're unable to work, they will help you back to health and help you back to work. I had one friend uh, who claimed on uh, this type of plan and over a year they were given physiotherapy, taxes to work and work workstation um, improvements so they could deal with their ailments. Um, again, in terms of trying to get turn up to work fit and well, there's also medical insurance, which is an option through uh, PPP Vitality, because every day you can't work or you're unwell or, you're, or something's not working right, you need to get fit and well so you can focus. Um, and that, yeah, that sort of insurance gets you to the front of that queue. And finally, life insurance, uh, most big companies offer that to their their staff, um, to be just so why wouldn't you as a director provide it for yourself? The company can pay for it, and the company can um, own it, and you can cover it yourself, any loans, your family, um, because it's an important thing. You know, thankfully, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, being able to turn up with a check for the family to take some pressure off of what's already a pretty bad situation is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the other question that we've got then is about pensions and savings. Now, I think it's important to draw a distinction between pensions for employees and pensions for directors. They're fundamentally different things. You know, as an employee, it's something your employer sets up and makes you pay into. And then when you get to about you know, late 40s, early 50s, you start to focus on it a little bit more uh, and hope you've got enough to retire on. But when you're a business owner, it's a very different thing. It's about one of the tools to help with profit extraction out of your business, how you get money out of your business and into your own pocket. It works really well with video games tax relief, which we'll talk later uh, with Luke about. But in essence, what we're trying to do is build your range of assets outside of the business as well, because that will diversify your investment risk. Potentially, it can help expand the business later on in your journey. Um, any money that goes into a pension is there for you and your family if you're no longer around. Uh, and I think also really importantly, if you have a range of assets, including a pension, it de-risks your exit strategy at the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, John, a lot of people when they're starting out, they worry or question about IP. Is there anything around that? Yeah, yeah no, de definitely. Se second on my legal list. Mm -hmm. um, so all the value in a sort of games business is, is, is going to be in the intellectual property, by which primarily the copyright in the um, in, in, in the game, it's the code, it's the art, the music, everything that sort of goes into it. Um, when you're starting out, it may be that several people are involved in the, the game's development process. And it's important to get that IP into where, where it needs to be. Um, if you go down the company route, which I recommend, um, anyone that's been involved in the development of the game should assign the IP in, in, into the company, uh, whether, that, whether they get shares for that or um, payments, um, depends on the circumstances. Uh, it may, may be that these people become employees of the company and enter into employment contracts with IP assignments. Um, anyone that isn't uh, an employee, consultants, contractors, and so on, um, should sign up to specific assignments of intellectual property for the company. Um, otherwise, later down the road, particularly if the game is commercially successful, they might argue that they, they still own part of it, and that, that, that would create issues. Um, also, hopefully, uh, Early stage, you're getting successful. You're talking of talking with um, publishers, other third party about the games. So I'd recommend having a, a non-disclosure agreement so that if you divulge confidential information to them, um, they they don't then use it for their own purposes. So yes, def definitely um, lock lock down the IP. Um, and then Luke, when obviously someone's starting out, 
and raising funds might be quite a big challenge or question that they have. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've been talking here about um, whether to be self-employed or limited company and what's the appropriate structure. Um, one of the one of the reasons um, that a lot of people do have to form a company, um, whether it's you know for all those other reasons, um, is because of um, it usually is the only route to obtaining certain types of grant funding. So, for instance, Innovate UK um, and UK Games Fund. Um, they're going to expect limited companies um, you know, to have been set up um, and, and they'll be paying to them um, in order for you to sort of obtain that sort of um, type of funding. Um, so um, on, on top of that, um, if you're looking at sort of corporate tax relief, um, which um, I'll, I'll mention a bit more about later on, but um, uh, things like video games tax relief, um, you can only get those um, if you're a limited company. So um, the game has to have been... Um, it, it can be designed whilst you were self-employed, um, but um, once you've started pre-production um, and actual sort of development of the game, you have to be a limited company by that point to qualify for video games tax relief. So it's important to think about that issue quite early on um, in, in, in your sort of setup and making sure that you, if you are going to want to claim those types of reliefs and, and obtain that kind of funding, that you're, you're set up in the right way early on. Um, there's a couple other things that um, I wanted to mention for, you know, in particular for startups, but it, it can it can affect um, more established business, uh, businesses as well. Um, and the first one is is regard to um, withholding tax, um, which um, usually applies when you are receiving income from overseas. So lots and lots of startups um, do um, develop their first game um, or games and, and put them on Steam, which is a, a US platform um, for games. Uh, purchased um, by consumers. Now, um, that income that they receive from Steam um, is outside the scope um, of, of, of sort of UK VAT and, and so on. But what does happen is that, let's say you, you had £100,000 worth of sales, Steam, before you receive your money, would take their cut, 30%, £30,000. And then, unless the appropriate documentation is in place, um, they would automatically be required to withhold uh, taxes uh, and give those to the IRS in America, and uh, that can be 30% as well. So you end up with £100,000 um, sales going into your accounts, £30,000 of expenditure, um, and a gross profit of £70,000, um, but you've actually only received £40,000. Um, then what happens is you work out your corporation tax position at the end of the year. If you've got sufficient tax liability, of, you know, so £30,000, you may well be able to offset um, that against the tax that you suffered at source. But if after the video game tax relief and everything else has come into effect and all your expenses have been claimed, you don't have a tax liability or you have less than £30,000, there's a very good chance that you won't be able to get the relief. So what you want to do is um, apply um, either with, with the US, you complete a form w 8 ben e um, or if you're an individual, it's a WA Ben. Um, and basically, you, you provide that to Steam or the, the US publisher if you're dealing with a publisher in the, from the US. Um, and that you request that they apply a 0% um, uh, withholding tax. And that means that you get your money in full, subject to Steam's cut um, for, for, for dealing with the uh, business. Um, and what that obviously does is it's a boost to cash flow up front because you're getting the money up front and it takes away the risk of not getting that relief on the tax that you paid up front as well further down the line. So uh, lots of reasons to, 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 to be aware of that one. And the other one that I found is very important uh, uh, and has had a massive impact on some of my clients um, is understanding the VAT side of, um, of matters. Oh, sorry, just, just going back on that, if you've got um, uh, sales from other countries around the world, you can also apply for um, uh, for no withholding tax by completing Res 1 forms, um, which you can find at HMFN and Customs, and it gives you a certificate of UK residence to sort of basically prove to customer for their own authorities that you are um, UK based and only pay taxes over here. Um, but carrying back to the, uh, the VAT side of things, um, where your sales are outside the scope of the UK, so what normally happens is um, when you're thinking about VAT is um, and whether you need to register, you have an £85,000 UK threshold turnover. But that is basically sales from your business to consumers and businesses in the UK. And you look at a rolling 12-month period, have I gone over 85000 Yes, I have. 
so I need to register within 30 days of the month end in which I've done it. But if all of your sales come from outside, or some of your sales come from outside the scope, uh, outside the UK, they fall, they fall outside the scope of UK VAT. So they don't count towards that 85,000 threshold. So what that means is you could have 200,000 pounds of sales all from the US um, through your Steam, and you don't have to register for that. So you can basically collect all of that and not have to worry about the admin of being VAT registered and doing quarterly VAT returns and all the pain. However, um, you can voluntarily register for VAT as long as you're a trading company. So despite the fact that there's no VAT coming in um, on your sales, um, you could still register for VAT. And what this allows you to do is reclaim all the VAT on your expenditure. So where you might have accountancy costs, legal costs, freelancers, um, you know, subcontractors, um, all sorts of different VATable expenditure uh, from, from people you're working with in the UK, you can now reclaim one sixth of all of that cost um, and get that back on your VAT returns, um, which again, another great boost to, to um, the cash flow. So a uh, hugely significant point to, uh, to take on board, I think, um, from that point of view. Okay, so if we move on to studios that are in the growing stage, um, we've, we've been asked before um, by someone within this stage that they've got their first successful game published and they're now looking at the next steps in their studio growth. What are the key things to be considered? Um, at this point of uh, growth for a studio, one of their main points of concern is how to best attract and retain the right staff. Um, Mark, what do you have to say about that? What issue? I think fundamentally, if you want to build a good business, you need good people. You need to attract them you know, and, and hold on to them once you've got them. Um, you know, most good businesses understand that there are you know, hard costs and soft costs in getting staff on board, depending on how you recruit. You know, the hard cost being you know, recruiting teams and things like that. Uh, the softer costs. Uh, and this particularly comes around when you, if you have to replace people like training, risk to project delivery, office disruption, and an experience gap. So they've got to hold it on to people is really important. Um, so when you design your reward package, your employee benefit package, it's important to you know, think about what the staff want, what they value, uh, and what they need, whilst all the time you're trying to get the best value for the budget that you've got. Um, and also it doesn't have to stay static. So when I look at staff, you know, when I've done this historically, you know, sort of soft things that staff will look at that are their development, the location, experience, flexible working people they're going to work with, things like that. Uh, and that's hard to put a cost on. So those are the emotive side. But when you come to the employee benefit package, you know, it's easier to put numbers on that. It's because you only pay a salary. Someone can say someone can pay me a higher salary. I'm off. The soft things will count, but ultimately the hard ones really do count. So when we're designing uh, an employee benefit package, we've got a, a guide if anyone wants uh, would like a, a, a copy of it. Um, I think there are kind of a number of key areas that we look at when we're going to design. So we've got um, you know, benefits you can provide to staff which you know, cover them illness, injury and death, you know, cheery subjects as before. <laughs> you know, back to the 99 pounds 35 per week, is that, you know, if your staff are unwell and unable to turn up at work, is that what you want them to, to be surviving on? Um, I guess the flip side of that as an employer is just like you would get uh, support if you were a director at this sort of plan. Uh, the insurance companies provide occupational health assessments if that's happening to people that they're really, really unwell, it will assess it and help them get better. Uh, if you have people that are more questionable, it will assess them and decide if they have a, a genuine um, occupational health support. It's a massive, massively useful thing. I guess I sourced. We've also got life insurance, pro medical, potentially critical illness, as we spoke about previously. Uh, you've got benefits that provide for old age, fundamentally, uh, pension. But how do you make them um, even more attractive to staff? And we find there are a couple of things because you're already obliged to provide pension scheme uh, under automatic enrollment, so staff pay 5% of the employee pay free. Uh, but you can also have additional contributions because there's some people. That's an important thing. You know, certainly when people get older, pensions become more important. Um, so we've got match contributions and also salary sacrifice, where uh, the, the staff for a given contribution get, can get more paid into their pension, which gives them a bigger fund um, at the end. And we've also got benefits which provide you know, psychological, physical, 
uh, and health support, I think like employee assistance programs where they have you know, certain tools and counseling associated with them as well as second opinion um, uh, from a range of doctors. If you can't get to your doctor because you know, that's quite, quite busy at the moment, the NHS. Uh, you can also have gym membership, solid work scheme, dental and optical, all these things kind of come within that. But I think for me, the key thing about all of those benefits, whichever you decide, however you decide to start that journey, is to communicate it to staff. Because if they don't understand the benefit, if they don't understand how to value the benefits, so you're probably not getting the best value from the spend mm -hmm. that you've got. Um, so that's generally the staff. And you've also got two other very important groups of people. So you've got your key staff, so business disruption. Insurance. If your key staff are unable to turn up at work or sadly pass prematurely, have you got them insured in some way so you can place quickly and promptly to minimize the business disruption? And that then extrapolates out to shareholders. So if you've got two shareholders you're working together um, and one is unable to turn up at work, how do you ensure the dividends? And also their family, because if you have a situation before where one of the partners of the business has died, the shares go to um, the deceased family. Um, and then you've got the other person's got a very difficult decision. Do they continue to work for half the dividends um, or you know, do they have a difficult conversation with the family who they know they've known for years? I think to the cost of a very simple, no cost insurance, you can get rid of that problem very easily. From um, a legal point of view, are there kind of staff incentives relating to shares as Mark was kind of talking about? Yeah, no, very, very much so. Um, Certainly one we see the most is the something called the EMI or Enterprise Management Incentives, which basically is a means by which companies can grant options to employees, uh, which can be exercised straight away or sub subject to vesting conditions. So same with the business for a certain period of time. So some shares might vest after one, two, three, four years, etc. But quite quite often they're um exit only options so if these options sit there and as and when the company sold or it does a little public offering then those shares can be exercised at the time um, from uh, an employer perspective they're they're very attractive because the um it's possible to agree an exercise price with hmrc that's actually less than the price of the share um, on the date of grant takes into account the minority holding and any restrictions over the shares. A um, big, big tax break is no, there's no PAYE or NIC on, on the exercise of the shares. Um, and if the shares are exercised and then sold, there are the capital gains tax reliefs, um, which are quite generous. So should, you know, if, if you use the release at the moment, the, um, you pay 10% on any gain over what you paid for the shares, what you made to sell them at. Um, so they're, they're, very, they're very popular. I've got a couple of transactions on at the moment where I've got um, all of the EMI option holders that are uh, going to get paid out soon, hopefully. Um, there are certain eligibility rules around EMI. You've got to be a full-time employee. You've got to work for about 25 hours a week. Um, so if, you, if you're not one of the, those people, you can still grant unapproved options to consultants and people like that. So you don't get the same kind of tax breaks, but they still um, potentially can give a, a, an uplift in the future to, um, to those people. Um, and going back to e EMI, a company can grant up to £250,000 worth of value in, in those shares. As, as at the data grant. So it, you know, it may be that kind of in the future those shares have gone up four times in value and you can sell them for a million potentially. So that, that's very popular. There, there are other staff incentives as well um, on, under the article. So I won't go into it now, but it, it's available. It's definitely EMI is the, the one we deal with the most. Luke, what are the alternatives to kind of more family that you've suggested that might be most helpful? Yeah, well, I mean. What, what I'm sort of following on from is a little bit of <clears throat> what Mark's been, you know, talking about retaining staff and, and ways to be able to do that. Um, and not just purely being on a sort of salary com competition basis, because it's going to be very difficult to compete with the big boys in terms of, you know, just on salary, purely salary. So you have to look at the alternatives um, that can help you sort of 
differentiate yourself as, a, as an employer from, from the usual sort of you know salary things. And so, you know, that can be um, very simple things, but, you know, flexible working hours, working from home or hybrid sort of set up, and um, maybe even four day weeks, um, you know, that's been trialed um, across the country in various places now. So um, that may well be a, a thing for the future and it could be something to implement sooner rather than later to um, get ahead of the, uh, the curve on that. Um, but there's lots of other sort of small things that, um, that you should be aware of um, you know, as, as a company that you can provide staff in terms of um, sort of smaller benefits. So the, the staff entertaining allowance of £150 per head um, per annum, um, where you can do a Christmas do or you can break that in two, that allowance to do maybe a summer do and a, and a Christmas do. Um, you know, and, and that is a fully allowable cost for the business, the VAT. It includes VAT, the £150, so it's £125 plus back that you spend, but you can get that VAT back and you can get tax relief on, on the expenditure. Um, and there's also something called trivial benefits, um, very simple Google trivial benefits, and, and, and you'll be able to see a lot about it, but basically they're non-cash benefits that you can give staff. Um, in close companies where there's, there's um, sort of only a few directors, um, it can quite often be restricted for the directors and the amount of times you can do that. Um, up to about £300 worth, um, and a total of £50 per um, trivial benefit. But, you know, really good things to, to be able to um, offer staff. And that can be sort of you know, anniversary um, little gifts um, for being there a certain amount of time or birthday, you can flowers or something, you know, whatever it might be. But these sorts of things are just nice sort of things to do for your staff and, and make sure that they're aware that you um, you appreciate them um, there and there. Uh, and hopefully that helps retain them. Um, <clears throat> there's something else I wanted to sort of talk about at this stage of the business um, for, for a, a lot of businesses is, is when they're looking to obviously grow a bit more, um, but they're needing more funding. Um, one thing to consider is um, seed enterprise investment um, scheme or the enterprise investment scheme. Fairly similar um, schemes. The seed enterprise investment scheme or SEIS is um, the business is up to two years worth of trading. Um, and EIS is for up to seven years and sometimes um, a few years more, depending on exactly what you're doing. But what this is basically doing is saying that you can um, give a, away a share of your company, so, you know, for example, 10% of your company in return for an investment from an investor, uh, maybe an angel investor. And you might say, OK, it's 10% of my company for £100,000. Um, if it's under SEIS, then the investor can actually get up to 50% income tax relief on their investments. Um, so the net, of, net cost of that investment is 50,000. And they've done that investment on, on the value they perceive of the company at the time and what they're then hoping will grow. And by the time you come to sell a business, they'll be able to um, make their money back. Under EIS, they get um, slightly less because it's a more established business, but they still get 30% um, income tax relief. Um, so um, it's quite appealing sort of way for investors um, to, to get their money. Um, but um, it, it, it's not necessarily the only way of, of doing it, but it, you, know, you are giving away a share of your company. Um, so you have to factor all those things in. But um, uh, yeah, something to consider, for sure. Mark, did you want to say something about property purchase before Don goes on to some final bits about the finance? Um, yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's an opportunity if someone has funded their pension well, one of the things that pensions can invest in is commercial property. So if you wanted your business to have premises to work on, your pension can purchase that and your business can lease from your pension. I think that's kind of like a pensions buy to let for your business, mm -hmm. which I think is really attractive. I think also gives you a huge amount of flexibility when it comes to the end of the selling business, because if you're in the premises you operate from and the business, that gives you two bites of the cherry two options on, on what you tell the business for. Don't you say? Yeah, I think so, so, certainly sort of this growing phase, um, it's likely a, a business will be looking to raise finance. Um, so so that, that there are various means out there. Um, it's going to the bank, getting bank, bank debt. Note that banks are likely to ask for personal guarantees from directors, um, so bear that in mind. Uh, there are other less formal routes, so friends and family sometimes like to invest and make loans into a, into a business. Or bank of mum and dad. Bank, bank of <laughs> mum and dad. If you're so fortunate. Yes. <laughs> um, 
the business angels, seeders, crowd crowdfunding platforms out there. So, so, so some of these uh, means raise finance. They're, kind of, they're, they're relatively new. Um, and, the, and the question is how much equity or percentage ownership of the business are you prepared to give away? Um, you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. That's a bit like going on to Dragon's Den and somebody <laughs> offers five percent, they end up walking away with six feet. But um, <laughs> very, very, dem- very much depends on the, the supply and demand. Um, at this stage, you, the, the company would be looking to restructure its constitution, so likely to enter into investment agreement, share, shareholders agreements, articles of association, which kind of basically set out consent rights for investors. Um, how often the board will meet, what, what happens if somebody, an employee leaves the business, what happens if they die, they, um, they, they're guilty of gross misconduct un, under their employment conduct, Think, things like that, you sort of anticipate what might happen in the future. So at that stage, um, you start looking at that in more detail. Um, also, at this growing stage, from a legal perspective, companies will be um, honing their contracts, so in the gaming sector, particularly publishing and licensing agreements, um, looking at royalty arrangements, EULAs, um, licensing of IP in, in and out of the business, so that's very important. Um, and also, as I was saying earlier, um, IP is crucial for the business. It's coming up with a, an IP strategy, looking after copyrights. Um, is there anything particularly uh, innovative that can be um, Patented sometimes there is, uh, and maybe registering trademarks so somebody can't go go and take your uh, your, your branding and logos and so on. I had that recently, got a message to say that somebody was using all of their branding, their, their website, and nobody else, all the name of their company, to release a game and have lots and lots of really bad sort of uh, stuff on it, and uh, they've been going tearing their hair out trying to sort out the uh, the issues and trying to clear all their name and the footprints so uh, it's certainly something to be uh, wary of yes yeah and it and it's um it, you know i can just see it's something that's going to get even more confused about metaverse and yeah. everything's going to getting mixed in but it's it, it's it's at this stage you know depending on the budget looking at an ip strategy so you're not infringing somebody else's ip and you're looking after your own um you know, cloning there have been various legal cases you know tetris for example um where, where sort of sought to protect your, your copyright. So loads of examples out there. If anyone's interested um, in looking at IP in, in more detail, and you know, do a, a session on its own on IP. Um, <laughs> what, what WIPO, through University of Bristol and Queen Mary College, London have done a, um, a research paper, which is um, interesting, looking at what's going on at the moment and in the future. Um, and yeah, just, just finalised on this kind of legal list is property, which, you know, Mark, Mark was sort of mentioned a moment, moment ago. So you can get sort of ad hoc monthly licences, you can get leases, freeholds, just depends on the situation of the business. So you're likely to looking at property side of things um, in more detail. Thank you very much. So if we move on to um, what we call kind of categorise as investment and mature business, which is where um, studio would potentially have a portfolio of games um, and a strong income stream um, and balance sheet, um, but they're looking to, to grow and develop additional games for this portfolio. So how would they structure their business to protect what they have and maximise any additional new revenue opportunities and investability? Um, Luke, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I think... Um... What I'd firstly say, um, this could potentially apply at an earlier stage than the mature businesses, but it's just as relevant at this stage than it is at any previous stage. But setting up a group structure is, is, is a great way of, of protecting um, both your IP and your profits. So what you would do is um, set up a holding company um, that sits above your existing trading company. Um, you would swap your shares in that trading company, the shares in, in the holding company. And so you now have a subsidiary and a, and a holding company. Um, and what that, that allows you to do is transfer the IP and any profits that have been generated today up into the holding company. So should anything adverse happen with that, that, that trading company, 
um, you, you, you've retained the IP um, and, and, and the profits. Um, so you, you, it's a very good way of protecting yourself there and, um, and de-risking um, from that point of view. But on top of that, and what you may, you may be, well be aware of, um, a number of um, businesses have, have started to do over the last few years, is set up um, a special purpose vehicle, which is a subsidiary uh, of, of a company. Um, in particular, where you've got a, um, a publishing agreement, um, and what the, the purpose of this is um, is for in, you to maximise the amount of video games tax relief you can claim. So, what normally happens with in a scenario where you've got a publishing agreement of let's say a million pounds to make a game over a twelve month period, you've you've put together a budget um, with man month weights. Um, that come all the way to form the million pound budget um, that you've asked for from the publisher. But those man month rates might be, for example, £7,000 a month um, for, for particular uh, nine uh, workers um, within, within the budget. And um, what you're actually paying them might be half of that. You know, you might have a £3,000, £4,000 a month um, salary, pensions, and et cetera, cost for those individuals. When you're claiming video games tax relief, you can only claim on the actual costs that you incur, not what you've included in, in, in the budget. So you set up this special purpose vehicle, and what you say to it is, um, you have to get certain legal documentation in place, um, which I'm sure Don can <laughs> do help with, but what um, you do is you uh, set up this uh, special purpose vehicle, and you say to the special purpose vehicle, um, would you please make this game on our behalf? And the special purpose vehicle says, absolutely, it will cost you one million pounds. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's how much the publisher is going to pay us. Okay. But then the special purpose people says, oh, well, we don't have any staff. And so the, the holding company says, that's no problem. We'll lend you our staff. How much is it going to cost? One million pounds. All <laughs> yeah. oh, right. Okay. So now the special purpose vehicle is the one that goes to the BFI, gets the cultural certification, and is claiming the video games tax relief. And now it can claim um, on the full million pound of costs. Um, so it gets £200,000, as opposed to perhaps half of that by claiming only on the costs in the, in the holding company. The video game tax relief is paid into the um, special purpose vehicle. It now has £200,000 of uh, retained earnings, which you can pay up to a dividend into the holding company um, and sit there to, to uh, you know, use those funds for future projects um, and cash flow. So... Um, a really good reason for uh, setting up the group structure there. Um, and I had uh, you know, a fairly recent case um, that took a, a claim from half a million to, instead of doing it that way, we set, we set up the SPV structure and, and it increased it to about 800,000, um, slightly more than that. But um, it, it was um, you know, just a perfect example of, of how this can work. Um, so very much um, worth considering. And John, did you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, no, that sounds well worth having, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I expect a few people out there that missed that restructuring trick. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We did yeah. have a question actually about it at the beginning. Oh, did we? Where it's obviously a, a big holding. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'll see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, from a legal perspective, got a maturing business, it's growing. Um, at this stage, you might might be looking to acquire other businesses, whether it's assets of the business it might be teams ip or it might be a another company itself you require the shares you go to, we'll talk about that process a bit later on in more detail um you can do an uh, initial public offering on aim to make basic means that you have the right to sell your shares to the general public um because you've you've um you've, you've issued a documentation, you're subject to very stringent regulations <clears throat> and reporting standards. So people buy their shares with knowledge that's in the public domain. So the idea of an IPO, it part, partly gives uh, people or shareholders a partial exit, but at this stage, it's more likely to raise funds for the business because they can sell shares. And hopefully if the share price goes up, you can do a new um, offer round and rate, raise more money. Uh, something else that might be considered at this stage is, is move, moving the IP uh, to a, another SPV, and, and there are certain tax advantages um, to having that offshore. Um, I think to too, too much detail for the scope of this conversation, but some, some, something to bear in mind if anyone's uh, potentially interested in that.
Yeah, well, I guess that this is this is a great occasion that the business is growing, it's working, games launch the success. So I think there's work to be done on continuing to build and develop the reward and the employee benefit package. Uh, you know, potentially with different categories of staff, different benefits that are more specific to them. Hopefully, we've got the framework in place to deal with any business disruption to key staff um, or directors and shareholders. Um, so what I usually find in this situation is money is starting to arrive and can arrive significantly and quite quickly. But never quite know how long it's going to last or how successful the game is going to be. Um, so the option then is leaving the money in the business uh, and maybe exiting later with uh, is nothing to move, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so either leaving it there or drawing it out now and paying whatever rate of tax that is required. If you're going to leave the money in the fund, uh, in the company, sorry, uh, you can either leave it in the current account with your current bank, but that's probably not optimal because you're unlikely to get a good rate of return and unlikely to maximise your FSCS. Coverage of financial services compensation scheme, which is 85,000 pounds. The bank shouldn't go bust, but so why take the risk? Um, so, something like a treasury management system to hold those funds, which does increase the protection that you've got with the FSCS and also improves the return, is a really sensible first step. The money is going to be left there longer term and making sure that it's protected from the ravages of inflation, which has become significantly more important in the last few months than it has in the last few years. Um, we also then talk about the director reward package. Um, for me, the key thing here is you want to diversify your asset base as a director. You don't want it all there in the company and everything being there. So diversify across tax, diversify across investment, and diversify across characteristics of the investment. So if your asset base looks like you have a home and property, you have your business, hopefully you've got your pension in place and that's working. You're drawing benefits out. You know, we've got a, kind of a guide if people want to know more about the benefits we spoke about earlier. And then we can look at an investment strategy as well. So things, simple things like ISAs uh, and investment trusts and unit trusts, but also tax efficient investing. So things like BCT and we spoke about earlier, EIS and SCIS. So not only can you get funds from them, if you have significant funds, you can invest and typically get between 30 and 50% tax relief which is a great way of, of getting money out of a business, particularly if you're paying tax, dividend tax, you know, in about like 32%, 31%. Thank you very much. Um, so finally, if we kind of move on to um, those studios that have potentially been approached by another business, um, this could be a publisher or another interested party, how would they successfully plan for this exit? Um, Typically, questions that are asked are how much is enough and what is the tax position for that exit? Mark, did you want to kick off on this one? Yeah, so really kind of fascinating place. In that. If you're starting off in business, you know, making money when you, you exit is obviously the key. So a lot of this re, re, will rely on previous planning to give you options. Um, you know, if you've avoided that, your business being your only asset and your only pension. So, yeah, we have to think about a number of things here. And certainly clients I've done this with historically, you know, how much is enough? How much do you need versus how much can you get? And I think there is a difference between those two numbers. Um, and I think that's an obvious question, but then you have to do other questions. Like, can I be an employee? And a lot of people who run business, set business, have made to work, then go into work for somebody else in their business who's going to tell them what to do. Can be a struggle, it can be a challenge. Um, within the package, do you need to work? Uh, do you want to work? Um, you know, what's next? Are you old enough to retire? You know, is it start a new studio all over again because you enjoyed it? Mentor somebody else, move into management, or even be an angel investor, be involved in a number of different studios and projects and use your contacts and experience. Um, the other really big question comes within the structure of the, of the offer. So how much is cash? How much is equity? Um, I had a scenario where you know, I had one client who had a significant equity portion um, uh, in the in the in the publisher that bought them, um, and that dropped in value you know, significantly by almost fifty percent uh, with the revaluation. That really does focus you on the risk of having everything in your company, and that's so being conscious of that. Um, so understanding you know, what the cash and um, uh, and equity share is, and how you then exit that those equities and those, those shares. Tax efficiently, how you manage your capital gains tax ETM return 
to an income that ultimately you want to get to a place where you have a diversified investment strategy across tax, investment characteristics, uh, so you can optimise how you, how, you, how you benefit from that. Thank you very much. Um, Don, what kind of are the legal things to think about when you're looking at exiting or selling? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a process, certainly, and it's actually what I went through in the summer when, when we, we sold our law firm tonight. So, um, sorry, very fresh. So I've seen it firsthand, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but, but so, so on, on a trade sale, it's basically selling the shares in the business. Uh, you could sell the whole thing if, if, if you uh, created SPVs, as Luke was talking about earlier. You sell the holding company that own, owns them all, um, or you could sell the individual SPVs. If we're talking about selling the whole thing, the group, um, you would go through a process, you would have a, a share sale and purchase agreement with mechanical provisions. Uh, not the agreement would be taken up with warranties whereby the seller would warrant the accounts. Accounts are correct, somebody hasn't been cooking the books, no disputes, all the IP. Um, it's been properly registered, no, no disputes, you haven't been reaching other people's IP, um, no, no disputes with employees and, and so on, sort of covering every aspect of the business. You'd have tax indemnity so that um, you, you'd um, pro promise that some tax has been paid up to date completion. If it hasn't, then the buyer would have a compensation against you. So when, when I say it's a process, um, these things can take several months. A buyer will want to do due diligence um, on the target business, ask lots of questions about every aspect of the business. Um, in, in terms of structuring the payout, Mark was saying, it can be cash on completion, that's the ideal, or just walk away with no worries. Often it's an earn out, a buyer might say, okay, you're doing all right at the moment, but <clears throat> um, How's a business going to be doing in 12 months time, two years time? We want you, the seller or management team, to stay on, grow the business, and you'll we'll get additional payment. Um, every transaction of this nature will be, the sellers will be subject to restricted covenants. So that it's usually, you know, two years, sometimes as many as three years. You can't compete with the business being acquired. You can't poach suppliers, customers. Um, use brand names, think, things like that, just to preserve the goodwill in, in the business. So um, very common um, to do a tr trade sale. Uh, there are IPOs as well, um, as, as another type of access where shareholders realize the value at the time. Uh, sometimes a founder might sell the business and the man managers um, take it over, and that's a ma management buyout. Uh, and often the MBO team will get external finance, say from a bank, and pay out the founder. So, yeah, so um, a, 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 another area that could sort of have a, have a separate seminar on its own, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you get if you get that far, it's um, you know, nice, nice, nice thing. And that's not to say you can't then go on when your covenants are done, you go and set up another business and do it again. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, there's there's two different ways of looking at it. Um, a lot of what Mark and Don have been sort of um, talking about is is when the company is being bought by another party, um, which you know can can happen and does happen. Um, and um, in in those situations, you can get specialist companies that, that will be able to do a valuation of your business to help give you the assurance that, that the deal is a good deal. Um, but you have to factor into that. Okay, well, maybe it is an earn out thing. Maybe, maybe you're now going to have to be an employee of, of, of the uh, purchase of the acquiring company. Um, is it enough for you to give up that sort of freedom of being your own boss and, and that earn, earn amount of earnings that you're doing that are making at the moment? Um, you know, if you're taking home £100,000 a year, for example, um, you know, and, and giving that up for a salary um, of maybe maybe similar or less um, for a couple of years, but you're going to be employed, you know, um, and being told what to do, hours to work, you know, how you do things and have to learn new systems, you know, you have to factor all that in um, to, to your decision making. Um, so there's that way up. But the other the other side of, of, of exiting a business could be that you are, you've reached a stage where you just want to stop, you want to kind of go into 
something different, uh, you know, close your business um, or you're ready to retire, um, whatever it may be. Um, and whether or not you're selling or you're closed, you need to look at the tax sort of implications of, of that. Um, now, if you're selling, um, then um, you, you're going to receive, let's super argument, say, say um, £5 million for your business. Um, then you need to look at the uh, consider the tax implications and what you're going to pay in terms of taxes. And at the moment, um, and we've got a budget on the 17th of November, so this could all go out the window next week. So, <laughs> but at the moment, um, on your first million pounds of, of earnings um, that, uh, from a business asset disposal, um, which this would be, um, is, is taxed at 10%. Um, so a very, a very sort of reasonable rate um, for that. And then everything else will be taxed um, at 20%. So um, relatively low rates of, of, of capital gains tax for that. If you're closing your business and the net assets are, let's say, a million pounds, um, then um, you would need to go through an um, insolvency practitioner and to do a member of voluntary liquidation, um, and they would need to go through the process. And that, that will cost you several thousand pounds to, uh, to get that. But by doing that, it will enable you to take the, the million pounds as a capital distribution, as opposed to having to pay out dividends to yourself and pay significant rates of tax, you know, 39%, you know, 40% uh, dividend, dividend tax, um, as opposed to paying probably uh, 10% on, on all of it, um, if it's a million pounds, um, worst case, 20% um, if you don't qualify for business asset disposal relief. So um, certainly worth being aware of the, of the two ways of doing that. So when you need a member's voluntary liquidation is um, when your uh, reserves are uh, basically more than 25,000. But there's always going to be, if it was say you had 100,000 left, you would be weighing up, is it worth paying a consultancy practitioner that money in order to get the capital treatment versus just paying out dividends and closing the business myself? So um, those are sort of decisions you can talk to your accountant with um, as a one comes to that. But following on from what um, Mark was talking about in terms of um, the sort of uh, cash and equity sort of uh, toss up um, when you're bidding it, uh, very much, it, you know, the risk is um, that you do get shares like uh, in some of the, uh, the deal that are offered and they can go up and down in value and you may be restricted by you know two three years before you can actually sell those shares so um, there's a big risk there in doing that but from again from a, a, a sort of tax point of view um, the cash will be taxable um, up front um, when you receive it um, and normally the shares are taxable um, the game when you sell them um, there is a possibility to elect to bring forward the tax um, on the on the shares at the value, <clears throat> but you take the risk that you pay tax on their value when you receive them, and then they drop in value and you pay more tax than you finally sell them than uh, you should have done. So <clears throat> lots of considerations uh, to be had around tax when you're exiting the business. Now, Mark, is there anything that you want to add to that? <clears throat> yeah, yeah probably not. It's, it's a big change in someone's lives so again, understanding the security and the implications for the shape of the event. Really important to have that discussion, modelling it, which we do with that uh, bespoke lifetime cash flow model, understand what the next section you take are. I think it's vital and it enables you to understand the risks that you've got um, and also the opportunity because ultimately we want these funds to enable you to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. that, whether that's your point. Okay, great, thank you. Um, many thanks for that um, discussion and going through all of those different stages of studios. Hopefully, that was interesting um, to those that are listening. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any questions that have come through, but one that um, I had was for um, Dom on, I know you said it was quite a big topic in itself, IT, but what could go wrong when it comes to IT? Is there anything that people should watch out for? Um, yes, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's IT falling into the wrong pocket, so it's uh, people have developed gaming, code, music, what have you, and they haven't assigned it into the company um, that has created issues. And lots and lots of cases of IP infringement, particularly copyright. Um, you know, you, you, you copy an element of our game. And it's it's always it's always very difficult, particularly say um, you think the infringers based somewhere like China to then try and enforce it. So it's 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 coming up with a strategy. How do we deal with that? Do we kind of um, do a Name, name and shaming exercise, uh, stop and desist letters, thing, things like that. So it, it, it's a massive area and it's a very kind of fluid area as well. Um, 
within gaming. Um, it's, it's making sure contracts are tied down as much as they can be as well. Thank you. And there's a question about SMB, which I think you've probably answered. But um, the specific question is, what are your thoughts on game companies setting up SMBs for each of their gaming projects for having numerous SMBs? Yeah, I mean, it, it can it can be, and it has been done by some clients, but um, it really depends on um, whether you think that you want to keep them separate for um, potential to sell those particular products um, to, to someone else further down the line. Um, I've got a number of clients who use one SPV for multiple games and just so they can get the, the, the structure set up, and it's quite straightforward to do it um, that way. But, um, yeah, you could do one for each. Um, it's just obviously you are also multiplying the number of accounts and TVs mm -hmm. and the like that you need to then have um, paid for. So um, for doing separate company accounts and things. So, um, you know, I think you can probably get away with having one subsidiary for most. Um, but if you really feel that there's a, a benefit from a sort of commercial point of view to having them separately, then, um, then why not do that? Thank you. Um, and a question which I think someone has done, what is the difference between Preferential and ordinary shares? Um, pre preference shares have, have special rights. So it might, might lead to a dividend. Um, quite often there'll be voting rights to protect that dividend. It might, they might uh, lead you first cut of um, any proceeds on a sale. So there are different rights that, that can attach to them. And, and if, if the company was liquidated, normally it's a preference share. And it's dividend that we get paid out first. Right, thank you. Um, uh, what dividend are the very popular one to go for um, is the, the UK Games Fund. Um, and um, if you go onto their website, um, I've got a, a two or three clients that have very recently um, won, I think around nine or ten um, recently. Um, you know, one significant startup funds, and that's one of the best specific for gaming industry funds. But if you're looking for general sort of funding, um, if you go to the you know, Jim and Customs website, there is a page on there that will give you a whole list of different areas that you can, you can go to for funding. Um, and that it doesn't necessarily mean because you're in the game sector that you, you can't apply for or for those. Um, they're quite generic in that sense. Okay, thank you. Um, and then what sort of Qualify for VGTR? Um, it's probably easier to start with the costs that don't qualify for VGTR, to be honest with you, because uh, it, it's quite a short list. And um, one of the, the, the main ones um, that, that, um, that impact on a lot of claims is, is advertising, PR, marketing costs. Um, they're specifically not allowed. So, what, when you're doing VGTR, you calculate the, the profit of the game. So, that will, if you've got that for your business, you're making a one particular game, any income, less all of your expenses is your profit or your loss for that game. And then out of all the expenditure that you've included there, you're then picking out what is allowable for the game's tax relief claim. That's your core expenditure. Um, the marketing costs within your profit and loss aren't allowed, um, but also um, fees for doing, doing video games tax relief claims, the audit fees and, and, uh, and the like aren't allowed. And um, in particular, loan finance, so interest payments and things aren't allowed. Their bank charges, um, uh, other overheads can all be apportioned to the uh, a core expenditure, along with all of your normal um, direct costs, your labour, um, that will be freelancers, employees. Um, and, you know, to the degree that you are involved in qualifying uh, work as a, as a director of the company, um, you can also claim for um, things like your employer pension contribution and life insurances and so on. So it's basically your remuneration package. Um, it, it, you may choose that not to have a significant salary or any salary at all as a director, um, which is fine, but you may have a you know, 20, 30,000 pound pension contribution going in, employer pension contribution. And that is your remuneration package, so it can be claimed as, 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 as a cost. One thing to bear in mind um, is that um, video games tax relief um, is due to expire. 31st of March 23, and we are yet mm -hmm. to, to get confirmation about whether that will be extended or whether it will be changed. Improved a bit. I spoke to Yuki recently, um, and they um, they said it's still being debated, and they're pushing for it to be better, um, and increasing the amount of relief uh, nearer to 32%, I believe. But um, 
I think we'd all be happy if they just retained it as it was, if anything, given what else is going on in terms of taxes and things out there in the world. You know, um, but it's obviously proven to be a great benefit to the industry. So um, hopefully we'll see some good news before long. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it from the questions. So thank you to everyone that's um, attended this morning. And thank you to our speakers, Mark, Luke and Don. Um, as you can see on the screen, there's some contact details there. And we're also sending a recording of today's session to you as well. So if there's anything that you took up from that discussion after the event, you can always contact these speakers directly and ask them for their guidance and assistance. So thank you very much. <laughs>